Yes. The boy stood on the burning deck. Uh, a reminder while we're while we're getting our seats to uh, to turn your phones uh, off or or at least to uh, to silent uh, during the the afternoon session. Uh, and and speaking of which, um, there is a little changing in program in that we're going to have all three speakers uh, speak consecutively without a break. There'll be a break uh, a after uh, after that. If you find the need to go out during the lectures, please do. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, I just wanted to make you aware of that. Don't feel that you, you're, you're compelled to stay, uh, to stay in, your, uh, in your seat. Um, I wanted to read a, 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 a portion of the Habs Circular Number 1, uh, which was issued on December the 12th of 1933. Uh, and, um, it was uh, in the category marked historical data. And Peterson says, it is anticipated that historical data incident to the buildings studied can be secured through local and state institutions and societies. Only the briefest uh, resume of facts is necessary in each case. Long accounts of genealogical matter and sentimental mythology have no place in this program. Factual matter only, uh, such as dates of buildings, owners, and other pertinent data is desired. So just the facts, ma'am, uh, an early uh, Joe Friday uh, was, was Charlie Peterson. One of the things that uh, is just remarkable uh, to consider is that it was sometime on the week of November 9th that Peterson penned that manuscript draft. Uh, it was on the 9th that Secretary Ickes, Harold Ickes, had issued uh, the call to the department heads to find a way to put 1,000 men to work for 10 weeks to get them through the winter of 1933 and 34. Remember, this was an emergency program. And so sometime during this week, 90 years ago, uh, Peterson was working on this. And it was approved by the, uh, well, it was, uh, it was approved by the Colonial Williamsburg team saying that this is a really good idea, who sent a telegram uh, in, in early December um, and approved by the Secretary of Interior um, by December the 12th. And by December 15th, a thousand people were at work in a federal program, <laughs> less than one month after it sprang from the head of Mr. Peterson. So, uh, aside from the the long term uh, the long term effect of it, just just the uh, just the the fact that something could get up and running that quickly, uh, and with such careful thought that we're still talking about it 90, 90 years later, uh, is remarkable. One of the, one of the people in the tradition of the Colonial Williamsburg folks that sent that telegram in, in 1933 uh, is our, our next speaker, uh, Willie Graham. He's an accomplished independent scholar with expertise in research, design, administration, and interpretation of traditional buildings, archeological sites, uh, and museums across America, the British Caribbean, Bermuda, and England. His specializ specialization lies in the comprehensive analysis, documentation, restoration, and reconstruction of historic buildings and landscapes. A summer internship at the HABS uh, survey eventually led to a staff position while pursuing a career, uh, an architectural degree at the University of Maryland. And from there, Willie embarked on a 37 year career. 37, that's nothing. <laughs> right, Ford? <laughs> 37, you're a newbie. Uh, a 37 year career with the Col Colonial Williamsburg Foundation where he served as their curator of architecture. During his tenure, Willie oversaw the architectural projects within the historic area, including the notable reconstructions of Charlton's Coffee House, the Market House, and the Peyton Randolph outbuilding complex, and the restoration of iconic structures such as Wythe House, Brush Everhard House, and the Courthouse. While there, he worked to establish industry standards in architectural practices such as paint analysis, tree ring dating, and mortar analysis. Uh, join me in welcoming Willie Graham.
I have to say I feel a little inadequate doing this because there's so many people here that know so much more about the HABS program um, and I think even a lot of the early Williamsburg uh, material than I do. But um, I think I have a unique perspective on it having uh, worked in both programs. Um, so the partnership between the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and the Historic American Building Survey has played a crucial role in shaping our comprehension of architectural heritage since the founding of these two institutions. Colonial Williamsburg championed fieldwork as a cornerstone of the town's restoration from the outset and was an early advocate for creating a national recording program, which became the Historic American Building Survey. Today, I will explore the enduring collaboration between Colonial Williamsburg and HABS, a relationship that extends back to the founding of both organizations. I also plan to discuss my own experience in recording buildings, starting with a summer job as a young college student hired to work on a HABS project 45 years ago. So we're half, sort of halfway between then and today. What I learned during my time at HABS and the skills I gained prepared me well for my time in Williamsburg, where I oversaw recording, restoration, and reconstruction efforts for the foundation. Williamsburg's unwavering dedication to field investigations proved to be the key component that both enriched the interpretation of the historic town and that paved the way for the reconstruction of missing structures, restoring the grounds to its pre-revolutionary state. Throughout its history, fieldwork remained a central tenet of Williamsburg's efforts, serving as the bedrock for its rebuilding. One can argue that the fortunes of both organizations have been intertwined since their inceptions, that the golden years, if you wish, of one of these organizations generally tracked with that of the other. Let me start with the founding inspiration of the two places, the fortuitous meeting of key players in the National Park Service with the Williamsburg Architects and the team assembled by Dr. Goodwin for John D. Rockefeller to run the restoration effort. As a review, you will recall that Rockefeller's philanthropy and especially his work in Williamsburg came, out, came about because of complicated reasons. The town's restoration helped reshape his legacy from one associated with labor strife and corporate greed to that of a committed philanthropist using it to contribute to the public welfare and to promote his vision of American heritage. On the eve of the Williamsburg experiment, Rockefeller was seen as the embodiment of greed and corporate malfeasance. The height of his unpopularity arose from the Ludlow Massacre of 1914, which resulted in the death of numerous minors and family members, including children. This event prompted widespread outrage and cemented his reputation as a callous industrialist, especially among the American working class. It was in this context that Rockefeller shifted towards philanthropy to counteract his negative image and to demonstrate a sense of social responsibility that was not evident in his corporate practices. His efforts in Williamsburg were a particularly visible and impactful part of that strategy. Coincidentally, Dr. W.A.R. Goodwin, rector of Bruton Perry's church, sought a partner to restore his beloved city and persuaded Rockefeller of the importance of preserving it. Goodwin, Goodwin's appeal was strategic and impassioned. He emphasized the significance of Williamsburg in the context of American history, as it was the capital of Virginia during the colonial era and played a pivotal role in the American Revolution. For Rockefeller, this was an opportunity as a patron of preservation to make an educational impact by bringing American history to life. His idea was to transform the colonial capital into a living history museum where visitors could experience the feel of early America. He was convinced by Goodwin's vision and passion, and by 1926 began substantial monetary support for the project. With Rockefeller as the financier, Goodwin was placed in charge of the operation, and he brought in the Boston architectural firm of Perry, Shaw, and Hepburn to oversee the restoration. William Perry was charged with leading the team and was actively involved in the restoration process, insisting on rigorous historical accuracy and the use of traditional building methods to create a sense of authenticity for the project. While the firm remained in Boston, they staffed an office in Williamsburg. One early astute hire was Thomas Waterman, who should be recognized for his role connecting the Williamsburg team to the eventual Habs project 
and inciting an academic desire to do field work. Waterman exemplified the New England-centric view of the early operation. The firm remained based there. Waterman had attended MIT before clerking for noted Boston architect Ralph Adams Cram. Waterman also worked with Harvard grad William Sumner Appleton, founder of the, uh, of the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, and later was associated with Harvard grad and noted architect Fisk Kimball. Clearly, his relationship with these men influenced Waterman's ideas about traditional architecture. Perhaps most importantly, these men helped instill the importance of learning from the buildings themselves in the pursuit of understanding the architecture of early America. The point of these associations is that the restoration team's ideas about the appearance of colonial design was colored by their views of New England buildings, a form better understood than those in the South. Waterman recognized the need to seek local precedent for the restoration, and he and others in the office fanned into the countryside to record buildings and details which they felt were relevant to the effort. Another of the early hires was landscape architect Arthur Shercliffe, who joined the Williamsburg office in 1928. An MIT grad, Shercliffe was advised by Frederick Law Olmsted to attend Harvard for postgrad studies, and upon graduation, he started working for the firm of Olmsted and Elliott in Brookline, Massachusetts. When he moved to Williamsburg, Shercliffe eagerly joined the weekend recording ventures to pursue his interest in colonial landscapes and gardens. Shercliffe assembled his resulting fieldwork into a manuscript which he intended to publish but never did. He called that work Southern Places. The importance he placed on documenting historic landscapes is best understood in his foreword to that work, which reads in part, when we all undertook the restoration of the Williamsburg Places, we realized that we could not do the work well without knowing a great deal more about the Southern colonial places. We learned about these facts by rapid visits made from place to place. Gradually, our knowledge increased, also our wonder at this Southern planning. It was so good and so unlike the planning in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and New England. We then decided to make accurate tape measurements of the old places, which seem most typical and most free from modern changes. This methodical work required a, great, a good deal of time, both in the field and in the office, for drafting. While these studies were being made, the restoration of Williamsburg was in progress. We found the studies of the old Virginia places were of the utmost value to us as a guide when we were confronted with traditions, descriptions, deeds, maps, pictures of old Williamsburg, and the revelations of the excavations. Oftentimes, the knowledge of Southern Place characteristics enabled us to make decisions when other evidence was disputed or incomplete or out of period. The future of this data to us in Williamsburg is twofold. First, it will continue to help in the continuation of restoration work. Second, it will make a record safeguarding that work. I mean that coming men, if they study these records, will see that there is a precious character in the design of Williamsburg places, which will be corrupted if place designs from the north or west are allowed to make their appearance in the city in the process of upkeep. Many of the old places which we have measured and photographed are rapidly falling into ruin. The records will be valuable in preserving the facts regarding these places individually and as part of the whole Southern Place tradition. Sure, Cliff was not the greatest prose maker, but you do get the sense he understood the significance of recording historic sites and the benefits that work imposed on the restoration effort and for posterity. The work in Williamsburg, the, the work of the Williamsburg team brought innovations to the practice of preservation much of it developed in the new Williamsburg Laboratory. Perry's team needed to understand interior treatments, and so they hired interior designer and Boston native Susan Higginson Nash. Nash combined field work with documentary research to great effect to furnish historic interiors. She made a lasting contribution to the field through her study of colonial era paint colors. As an early act, she joined a recording team from Williamsburg in 1929 on an extended tour of early Eastern Virginia and Maryland buildings. According to paint analyst Susan Buck, results of Nash's work from this trip was the first attempt to record and reproduce early architectural paint colors in a systematic way. The method of analysis was unsophisticated by today's standards, but it did provide the underpinnings of a sustained effort by the architects 
and later by other researchers to better understand the early building stock of America by using, a paint, by using paint as a component of that inquiry, an element of architectural investigation which evolved into an indispensable part of serious traditional building research. The team instinctively knew that early buildings in Williamsburg were inherently different from Boston and that they needed Southern scholarship and sensibilities to provide authenticity to their work. Nonetheless, they were fragmented over how to execute that design. Historian Carl Lounsbury wrote of their conflicting views in an essay about the early days of the Restoration. He, he observed the Universal Beaux-Arts training of the architects, a curriculum which emphasized Renaissance notions of balance, axiality, compatibility of plan and elevation, and the formality of classical design. He notes that the team sought reassurance of these ideas in the field work they undertook, which they could then impose on the town's grand restoration. Architects who were convened as a consultatory committee to the project advised on the philosophy of the restoration. They involved many distinguished fig figures, including Ralph Adams Cram and Fisk Kimball, already known to Waterman and presumably to the rest of the Boston, his Boston colleagues. Perry noticed that the advisors fell into two factions, with one group favoring excellence of design based on satisfactory precedent, while the others believed an authentic Virginia precedent should be required for all designs. Dr. Goodwin called the second group the archaeological architects because they favored strict adherence to immediate evidence and regional practice over more generalized aesthetic artfulness the first group preferred. <clears throat> the philosophies were manifested in the work produced during that era. These were heady times in Williamsburg. Rockefeller was pumping millions of dollars to, into the town and the architects were madly restoring buildings, excavating sites, reconstructing others, and transforming the place into the largest outdoor history museum in the world. The team learned on the fly, developing new methods of analysis and conservation, and attempted the highest of standards in the production of their work. Meanwhile, the National Park Service sent a young 24-year-old Charles Peterson to the area. He arrived to play a central role in the planning and development of the Colonial National Historical Park, which included Jamestown, Williamsburg, and Yorktown, as well as overseeing a new Colonial Parkway used to connect them. Peterson's work ensured that the parkway enhanced the visitor's experience of the historical sites by preserving the natural and historical integrity of the landscape. In many ways, he was the Park Service's answer to Waterman and Shercliffe, being involved being involved in both building restoration and creating a landscape which tied it all together. The architects involved in Williamsburg were part of the same nascent preservation movement that Peterson was helping to shape within the Park Service. During these intoxicating times, Peterson wanted to be in the thick of things and sought Goodwin's help to find a place to live, settling on the Palmer House in the middle of the fledgling restoration. With his proximity, Peterson was surely influenced by Perry and Perry's and Waterman's rigorous standards for documentation and their holistic approach to historic sites, lessons he used in Yorktown and that which he took with him when he led the new Historic American Building Survey project. <clears throat> building of the Habs collection complemented the work in Williamsburg by providing a broader context and by linking the restored town to other significant early sites under the stewardship of the parks, thereby enhancing the educational and historical value of the entire region. Peterson's contributions included the development of his philosophy of architectural archaeology, which documented the layers of a building's history. This was a major shift from previous practices that favored restoration to a single period at the expense of others. His development of the historic structure report as a product of systematic building analysis was another innovation that has had lasting impact. On the Williamsburg side, Nash's work further advanced the complexity of building analysis. Her approach, however crude, of using paint history as an archaeological tool to reveal layers of history through color anticipates the modern forensic techniques of the field. Combined, these ideas matured into precepts for the emerging practice of architectural investigation and building conservation. Peterson's greatest legacy, however, includes pushing Harold Ickes to fund 
the Historic American, American Building Survey, a New Deal program intent on employing out-of-work architects. While Peterson's Habs venture focused on a broader range of American architecture, the Williamsburg architects contribute to and drew from this rich and new repository of information, creating a synergistic relationship between the two preservation efforts. Catherine Lavoie, the current chief of HABS, reminded me that it was Peterson's interaction with the Williamsburg architects that helped provoke the idea of a national recording project to be funded by the Civil Works Administration. With the initial phase of the restoration ending in 1934, Perry Shaw and Hepburn stepped away as architects of the operation and the architect's office was brought in-house. Many professionals who worked under Perry left and established new careers in which they leveraged their time in Williamsburg to extraordinary effect. One of those was Thomas Waterman, who joined Peterson's new Habs venture in 1933. Waterman added credibility to the Habs program, having already distinguished himself and helped Peterson launch the program with flair. World War II halted the Williamsburg operation, which by this time claimed restoration and reconstruction of around 300 buildings and the demolition of nearly 600 modern structures. With cessation of the war, work immediately resumed, but this was a different era. Jack Waite gave us a good account of what was happening uh, in the post-war years uh, at Habs. But in Williamsburg, names less familiar worked in the architect's office, including Ed Kendrew, who headed it, and Paul Buchanan, who was eventually promoted to director of a newly minted office of architectural research. While the staff vigorously pursued building investigations and field work remained essential to the operation, this era was not one of great innovation, either in methods of study nor in conservation techniques. Williamsburg relationship with HABs also changed with a collaboration less about shared academic and artistic interest and now with the foundation serving as a client and recommending students to help feed the government program. Yet Kendra and Buchanan weren't all to blame for this laissez-faire approach to preservation. The administration stifled some of the work for the sake of schedules and budgets. The architect's office increasingly used formulate prescriptions for design that often skimped on research to produce near cookie cutter colonial buildings. This was a far cry from the work of the early restoration architects and Charlie P Peterson's energy of the 1930s. Still, as the nation anticipated the bicentennial, Williamsburg geared up for the onslaught of visitors they hoped would show. President Carl Hummelsheim advanced the mission of the foundation through new educational and restoration initiatives. He made two notable hires, which have had lasting impact on the organization, naming Graham Hood as the vice president of collections in 1971, and in 1975, recru recruiting Kerry Carson from his work in St. Mary City to serve as the director of research. During his tenure, Carson's research focused on studying material culture of the 17th and 18th centuries, arguing that historical artifacts from simple household items to grand buildings artic articulate the human experience beyond their utilitarian functions. He posited that material objects encoded the ambitions, social norms, and the values of a society. His research uh, advocated for a reading of material culture as a detailed language that, when deciphered, reveals the complexities of human life and enhances our understanding of history. These ideas colored the work of the organization for the next 40 years. Important to our discussion, Carson and his interest in material culture Carson used his interest in material culture to derive new meanings from the buildings he studied. While in St. Mary City, as an avid field worker, Carson led a team of historians to record Maryland's earliest dwellings for Habs. Their drawings differed from the Habs formula. They were diagnostic, and the graphic conventions Carey promoted, taken from his experience as an archaeologist, better presented a building's structural makeup and evolution than did conventional architectural drawings. He brought this model to Williamsburg, where a newly reformed architectural research staff a few years later adopted it as a more effective way to convey meaning in the drawings they produced. This was about the time that I showed up. But first, I had to get there. 
As a junior in college, a classmate urged a friend of me to join him in applying for summer work with an agency of the now defunct HCRS. I was going to avoid the hookers uh, <laughs> reference, but uh, we were game, put our portfolios together, and hand delivered them to Pat Jacob, who coordinated the summer hires for HAPS at that time. Overly anxious to learn our fate, we returned weekly for updates. After a month or more of interruptions, an exasperated Pat finally declared that she would hire two of us if we would just simply leave her alone. <laughs> and I doubt my fortune of getting one of these slots was due to a superior application, but whatever the case, she sent me to Baton Rouge for the summer. As the youngest, least schooled, and the most naive of our group, I had a lot to learn and a great team to teach me as well as extraordinary buildings to use as a laboratory for that exercise. This experience set a course for my career that cannot be undersold. Two teammates from Baton Rouge were going to attend today, George Steinrock, who is here someplace back there, um, and a fellow, uh, who was a fellow architectural student at the time, and historian Sybil Groff, who I'm sure many of you know, um, but at the end she could not make it. While the architectural students taught me how buildings went together and how to record them, Sybil instilled in me their importance. Because I attended school in College Park, I was able to work for HABs year-round in DC and juggled school and, and work. I was charged with completing old projects and spending summers on dis distant new ventures. Our duty was to finalize the St. Mary sheets that Carson's team had produced which gave me insights into his different ways of presenting information. I was sent to Tucson in the summer of 79 to work with Bob Giebner, an architect with extensive habits experience of his own who continued my education in reading and recording historic buildings. That summer, Habs photographer David Kaminsky gave me instructions on how to shoot images, lessons that I still reflect on today. Fortuitously, I went to Williamsburg as one of my last field outings for HABs uh, to record several undocumented outbuildings. The education provided by HABs over these couple of years and the opportunities to work on projects from Boston to Arizona, and especially the Williamsburg venture, pushed me to the front when Ed Chappell, the newly appointed director of architectural research at Colonial Williamsburg, called HABs looking for a fellowship cam candidate. He wanted someone to study and record early outbuildings in preparation for the eventual reconstruction of domestic work buildings anticipated to be recovered by archaeology at Carter's Grove, a nearby plantation acquired by the foundation in 1969. While the outbuildings were not discovered, a home house slave quarter complex was, and we eventually reconstructed it based on our work on extensive field study of surviving quarters. The team assembled for the new architectural research office included a long list of folks with HABs experience. Mark Winger, the first hire, previously worked for HABs recording Westover. Ed Chapel produced HABs drawings as part of his studies at UVA. Mark Shara, who was here, uh, has since returned to HABs, worked with us for a spell, as did Doug Taylor, another HABs alum. HABs became the training ground for architects and historians who entered the design, museum, and preservation fields and provided them with experience and made them useful the day they started their new careers. I was lucky to be counted among this group. With this cadre of HABs alums, we reinvigorated the early restoration's affinity for studying buildings and immediately took to the field. We were sent to study, measure, and photograph structures, but look for different things than the founding fathers did, where they sought order, symmetry, classical element, elements, and timeless designs we pursued a broader examination to encompass the different, the ephemeral, and look to see how buildings revealed the intent of their use. Perry's team wanted to firm up the formal aspects of the town. We wanted to flesh it out, show how it was lived in by the ordinary and the exceptional alike. While we re-restored grand houses and shops to fit a more nuanced appearance, understanding of their appearances, we also tackled restorations and reconstructions which broadened the story to portray how society was organized, how the gentry and professional class lived and were entertained, the realities of working in craft shops, and what life was like for the enslaved workers. 
To this end, we reconstructed an insane asylum, rebuilt the public armory twice, fleshed out domestic work yards, the courthouse was restored and its interiors recreated, taverns were refreshed, a coffee house was rebuilt, slave quarters erected, and the landscape reworked that tied these pieces together. The basis of these new interpretations and restoration works, uh, efforts was the field work which supported it. One final project that exemplifies the approach of our new office was the research effort to create a plausible des design for the reconstruction of the town's third theater. The designs sit in a drawer awaiting for someone to prioritize its building. We, we used a formula honed over the past few decades to create a plausible reconstruction. The approach gave primacy to physical evidence, and without an extant structure here, archaeology provided the baseline parameters. No matter how strange or unlike other known theaters of the day, its footprint was considered sacrosanct, and we had to follow the revealed evidence wherever it took us. We next explored documentary sources specific to David Douglas's operation and reconciled it with the archaeological work. Although this was a specialized structure, it was erected by local craftsmen using methods familiar to them, and we premised that its ordinary parts would appear much like those of other buildings in Williamsburg. Thus, we tackled field work at home, recording building frames, drawing local molding profiles, and sought patterns in their temporal and social distributions. We then cast our investigative net further afield, looking to find what was universal about late colonial buildings across Eastern Virginia, and finally to seek out what other Georgian conventions were shared across the English colonies and in Britain. Since no 18th century theater survived, we visited and recorded all that remained in England. After all, their model was like the commercial operations here. Finally, given the paucity of fittings uh, common to all theaters of the Western world, the pulleys, traps, fly lofts, and the like, we visited many of the better surviving small Baroque theaters on the continent to flesh out these final details. With a constant massaging of the design, we settled on one that fit the evidence in the ground, made sense of the documentary history, and worked within the parameters of the commercial Georgian theater of the day. Such a scheme wholly depended on solid field work for its credibility. Sadly, when Mitchell Reese took over as president in 2015, he systematically dismantled the research division, using staff salaries to fund capital improvements in hotels and restaurants that he mistakenly felt would entice more visitors to town. As, as a result, by January of 2017, only the bones of the library staff, a couple archaeologists, and Jeff Clee, one of the architectural historians, remained. As that day approached, we feared for the survival of the thousands of field records produced by our office. They were slated for the city dump. Ed Chapel started negotiations with Catherine Lavoy earlier to include some of them in the Habs collection, particularly those produced for what we call the Agricultural Buildings Project, as our outbuilding study was known. With only Jeff left, he and the Department of Collection staff worked with Catherine to print copies of these drawings on Habs borders for inclusion in their collection. Happily, this work is nearly done and will become widely accessible. Moreover, with the recent replacement of Reese, the foundation has ensured the survival of this past work produced by the office. Now, no longer working for the foundation, I continue to use field work as the basis of restoration, um, building interpretation, and reconstruction projects. When feasible, I urge clients to convert project drawings into HAB submissions, as we did recently with our work at Cloverfields on the eastern shore of Maryland. There, we worked with Catherine to create three distinct sets, one that reflected the building as it existed, one as restored, and a house set to capture the reworked landscape in its gardens. With this work, we attempted to raise the standards for drawing submissions using Carson's notions of analytical drawings, providing three-dimensional recreations of building frames and adding color where it could help provide deeper meanings. In closing, the enduring partnership between the Williamsburg Restoration and HABs embodies a profound dedication to the preservation of our architectural heritage. The meticulous fieldwork that anchors 
both institutions has not only sharpened over the years, but also underscored the importance of each detail in narrating our, our nation's story. The synergy has taught us that to preserve ensures that the whispers of history are not silenced in the hustle of the present. As guardians of history, it is their shared responsibility to continue this legacy with vigor and foresight. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mario Santana Quintero. Uh, Professor <clears throat> Quintero has contributed to conserving precious world heritage sites worldwide thanks to his innovative digital documentation methods. He is cross-appointed in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Arizelli School of Architecture and Urbanism and the Immersive Media Studio Lab uh, at Carleton University. Besides his academic work in Canada, he has served as the immediate past Secretary General of uh, the International Con uh, Council of Monuments and Sites, ECOMOS. And he is an honorary president of the ECOMOS Scientific Committee on, the Her on Heritage Documentation. He has collaborated on several international projects in heritage documentation for the Getty Conservation Institute and UNESCO, among others. In recent years, he was awarded a doctorate honoris causa from the University of Liege in Belgium. Uh, join me in welcoming Mario Santana Quintero. Um, thank you so much, Bruce, for your welcome words and also introducing myself. Um, I also would like to thank a number of people because I, I realize that I have actually met many of my old friends while coming in Philadelphia. I used to teach here, and also I have been uh, meeting some of my friends from HAPS. And even though I feel a little bit like an outsider, and obviously as a new Canadian, I have to apologize at some stage. Uh, Canadians usually apologize. <laughs> and. <laughs> Obviously not to Americans. I, I just did the, I mean, I, I, I just did the, um, the citizenship exam and there are so many questions about you guys not coming to invade uh, Canada. So I was really <laughs> surprised about that. Anyway, um, I, yes, I have a kind of Belgium, Canadian, Venezuelan accent. So I also apologize if my English is not perfect. And um, yeah, and I want you to welcome me back in this Habs family. So actually, even though I, I, I didn't go into a summer intern, I didn't know about this summer program at HAPS, I would have applied. Uh, I did when I was teaching uh, during my tenure at the University of Pennsylvania, I invited HAPS to come and teach some of our students and that was really useful and I found this, these nice pictures back in my, in my archives. And uh, we also organized a smart dog conference in Philadelphia where HAPS was predominantly present. And I had the opportunity to invite Richard O'Connor to keynote at one of the CIPA, the Heritage Documentation Scientific Committee conferences that we organized in Ottawa. And that was challenging because obviously HAPS staff cannot travel overseas. And it took a number of negotiations and fundraising to be able to have Richard. But that was one of my points because many people do not know about this program outside the United States. And actually it's pretty good and it could be an example to be followed in many other countries. So I want to talk about three things today. Uh, the first one is kind of a giving. Uh, I am an academic, so I need to be a little bit more, you know, scientific. So I want to talk a little bit about Bill Heritage contributing to sustainability. I want to talk about heritage recording as a job and heritage recording as a job that requires rules and obligations. And this comes from my humble experience. I don't have the experience of Bruce of 40 uh, plus years. Uh, I only have like maybe five or 10 or maybe 20, uh, and <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about that. So let, let me talk about Bill Heritage contributes to sustainability. But before that, obviously the spectrum of, of cultural heritage is very broad. And obviously in this conference, we are dealing with Bill Heritage, but there is a strong connection between the intangible, the intangible, 
the movable, the movable, and even the underwater cultural heritage. I have the privilege to be able to have worked in different projects where the tangents of these aspects have been, you know, deeply uh, studied. And, you know, historic places have attributes or character defining elements, as we call them in, in, in Canada, and they need to be formally recognized. And this is one of the aspects that I always introduce in my courses to the students, that something needs to be formally introduced, but before that happens, we need to study it, right? And so it, that's why documentation is so important to be able to conserve our building stock uh, and historic stock throughout the world. And obviously, you know, material forms uh, and the spatial configurations, all these aspects you know very well, uh, working with HAPS uh, standards, are very important to be able to understand where we need to retain the value and how we need to preserve in, in, in the phases of change. So in Canada, we have historic places, we have these attributes or character defining elements, and we try to conserve them. Obviously, we always talk about uh, the significance, the value set of these particular sites. I usually put a picture of a puck uh, in my lectures when I'm teaching, and I said, you know, what does this mean to you? Canadians always know what it is, but in my foreign lectures, people say, is that a Bluetooth speaker? That's kind of really funny, but that actually goes to my point about, you know, uh, understanding each other's values. And obviously, you know, the physical integrity and the preservation of places. But, you know, heritage, according to my colleague Jean Caroon from the States, from Boston, you know, historic ba buildings have embodied energy, embodied carbon, materials are made of durable uh, uh, stuff, uh, materials are, you know, may, uh, extracted from areas close to the buildings, they can be repaired, they have this long life, loose fit, and they have this passive survivability. So I think that with all these aspects, we can actually say that historic buildings are pre pretty much sustainable. Uh, contribute to sustainability, in particular, you know, with the issues of climate adaptation. And the field of conservation is about managing change, and obviously drawings allow us to see the state of conservation of places and then understand how, you know, changes can happen, how changes have happened in the past, and how new changes and, and, and new, you know, adapting, obviously, historic buildings to contemporary needs and functions also requires a lot of attention. So heritage recording as a job, I, I was always passionate about Abu Simbel as one of the simple uh, examples of safeguarding places of value to everyone. These temples in the 60s mobilized a whole campaign by UNESCO to safeguard them. And I had the privilege to be taught by Maurice Carbonel, who was one of the uh, French uh, photogrammetries that recorded the Abu Simbel temples before they, are, they were you know, chopping pieces and moved across uh, uh, some, some lands and then reconstructed elsewhere. And Robin Letelier, uh, also a Canadian expert, uh, also a specialist in, re in, in recording, uh, talked about this relationship the, about you know, the different aspects when we need to record, uh, where we need to record, what we need to record. But I want to emphasize, obviously, on who is recording and why we are recording and how we are recording. But I think pretty much throughout the morning, we have been talking a lot about the why we do heritage recording. And we have been seeing a lot of the how. And I think Paul is going to talk a lot about the how, too. <laughs> I'm looking at him now. <laughs> so obviously, documentation starts from identifying, recognizing a place, and then providing some protection. And then we have some actions in preservation or conservation, such as rehabilitating, restoration, reconstruction. And in many aspects, we also present the sites to be able to be um, you know, appreciated by other people. Uh, in digital workflows, we have different phases of work. Obviously, we need to plan ahead, talk to the client, what they need, etc. what are the needs of the project, then acquire the data, <clears throat> do the processing, disseminate. In some cases, we do simulations such as energy performance of historic buildings or a structural simulation and archival of, of the sites. But I think if you look at HAPS, probably you meet all these requirements. So new technologies allow us effectively to locate and orientate places. These are some devices such as you know, differential GPS and total stations that people need to be skilled to be able to use and to locate and position the places because obviously we all talk about you know, these intrinsic values of sites and orientation has something to do with that uh, a lot. And 
also allows to go to remote areas, these equipments, and do the recording very quick. These photographs are from the Chiribiquete World Heritage Site in Colombia, where we have been working for the last two years. Now, in our work, we do, um, we commission, we are commissioned a lot by the Getty Conservation Institute, and in particular, about recording uh, a, a painted, you know, paintings, uh, wall uh, paintings, uh, rock arts, etc. And color plays a really important work for, for conservators in this field. So we have developed uh, workflows in where we try to collect, we try to collect, to have the best illumination and also the best way of calibrating the color so the records that we produce are, can, can be used by, by conservation specialists and we had the privilege to work with the Getty and the Ministry of Culture in Egypt in the Tomb of Nefertari where we prepare the, the the documents, the measure drawings for the rehabilitation of the tomb, which is actually undergoing nowadays, uh, because as you know, uh, this is a very precious uh, jewel of our history, but it's, it's, it's small and <clears throat> many people uh, that go down to see the tomb actually touch the painting because you know they don't want to fall in the steps. So there has been a lot of issues of try to rehabilitate in such a way that it becomes easier for the visitor without compromising the integrity of the site. Uh, we have laser scanners and probably Paul will mention some of them. Accurate acquisition of geometry is also very important for us. These type of devices are part of our arsenal of technologies, and in particular, laser scanning actually allows you to, to collect data quite quickly. We also use aerial photogrammetry, drones in which we can capture the context of the site and, and areas that are unreachable to other devices, <clears throat> and they are rather quick. Uh, this is also an example from Chiribiquete. And we have worked in also in major projects. We have worked in the uh, World Heritage Site of Paphos in Cyprus. And in this particular site, we were working at a very high level, collecting all data from the archaeological site. <clears throat> but then the Getty was really interested in understanding the condition of some of the exposed mosaics. And we did a lot of testing about working with the flashes, etc., illumination during the day. Then we realized that we needed to work by night. We were working in the summer, summer in, in Europe, you know, nine o'clock is when it gets dark. So that's when we were working like vampires uh, doing photogrammetry. And we were able to do, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know if you, we can start this video. I don't know if you can click in the video, yeah. Yeah, if, oh, if not, it doesn't matter, yeah. Anyway, we, yeah, the video is not starting. It's okay. Ah, there it is. So in this uh, video, we basically dance in the, <laughs> in the, um, in this, in this uh, mosaic. We took about, I, I think we took about 700 photographs uh, at different levels, and we had two flashes. Uh, we were wearing socks. Uh, we were very careful with the panel, obviously. But what is interesting about this project is that usually when they uh, record uh, this type of mosaics, they, they water the mosaics and then they photograph the mosaics. But in this case, the Getty wanted to get the condition of the mosaic as, as it was. So, oh, I see the 10 minute sign. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is some of the examples of the type of photogrammetry that we were able to produce. Technologies also are able to provide tools to do digital storytelling, so improve the way that people can perceive and experience sites. Uh, the Cartoon Immersive Media Studio, where I work, we do a lot of digital storytelling. We're actually doing a project here in the States nowadays. We're working in Nevada. Okay, so heritage recording as a job that requires rules and obligations. Um, uh, for, you know, the, the increased pace of innovation is really excellent, but it's also threatening to us because how can we adopt these technologies in different institutions that have different procedures and different types of quality? The issue of the archives, uh, of longevity of the files, fragmentation of digital data about heritage all over the world, the posterity, how can we read records in the future, le the lack of provenance, and nowadays, of you, obviously, artificial intelligence that provides automatization. How can we you know, use these, these challenges as opportunities? Uh, throughout my career uh, working internationally, I have encountered that many of my colleagues use the digital file as the monument. And I don't think that the record should be the monument. The, the monument is the site. 
Uh, digital appropriation, me as a Canadian institution, I'm very easy for me to go in elsewhere in the world and appropriate from the digital data that I collect. But I think that we have a responsibility when we do that. Also how the data will be transmitted to the future. This misuse of the terminology of data preservation, we don't do data preservation when we record digital historic buildings. We only record very, uh, you know, the surface and maybe a little bit more of the site, but not many other things. And then obviously the lack of transparency in the protocols use for the collection of the data. So I had the privilege also to work in Bagani, Myanmar, and I invited a foundation going there with us. They funded some of our students. We had a workshop, and then they developed with Google Arts and Culture this experiment. This experiment was wonderful. It's a kind of virtual reality experience of Bagan, but everybody forgot to ask the, the site custodian in Bagan for permission to put this online. So that's when I realized that ethical commitments and obligations should be really governing the work that we do. I was also impressed by Econem's work in the uh, Institut de Montara, where they made an exhibition of Palmyra after the war with virtual reality experiences. Wonderful, uh, you raise awareness, etc. but do you have permission to show destruction of villages in Syria, et cetera? So I think that digital technologies have the potential to help us in our work, but also they have that challenge of, of you know, who is owning the data and how the data is being transmitted. And I had the opportunity to you know, use this new technology, Luma, which is NERF technology, and collect some data from the Liberty Bell. So new technologies are bringing new challenges, but I was there for about, 15 minutes making videos and all that, and nobody came to say anything to me. Uh, <laughs> and I just did a very high 3D record of the, of the place. And obviously, automatization, artificial intelligence is showing us a little bit of what it can wait for us. I don't think that we can deny it, the fact of development, but obviously, we should be systematically contributing to these developments ourselves, and I think that perhaps could have a, an important role there. So we have principles, the FAIR and the CARE principles for data, digital data. We are trying to adapt these kind of uh, aspects into the workflow of digital collection of historic buildings. Uh, as you see, if, if we look at some of these aspects, I'm sure that HABs meet most of them, uh, or not all of them. Uh, so when I had that experience in Bagan, I decided to do in my sabbatical and study about an ethical framework. I found that the ICOMOS and the Canadian Association of, of Heritage Professionals had a very robust ethical commitment for their uh, people, for, for us. And I discovered that actually, I, I'm not gonna talk about all the aspects, but I think probably related to qualifications and related to, to best practices and the respect to communities and the public that we serve are really important responsibilities of any heritage uh, professional. And I think if we develop a good professional uh, practice, you know, this will be very helpful for clients in the decision making in understanding what our work entitles, how is it done, and how we can improve the sharing of the data and, and then also the, the, the longevity and, and you know, the transmission of this data. And the beneficiaries of this will be obviously us as specialists, the public in general, and the cultural organizations that we serve. Uh, in the SIPA Heritage Documentation Committee, we are currently updating the principles for recording of monuments, groups of buildings and sites for 1996. We now call it the principles for recording cultural heritage uh, to be adopted hopefully next year or maybe the year after by ICOMOS. And we are looking into these eight aspects. And if you're interested, I invite you to contact me and I can put you, to get, I can put you in the group that is looking into the, into the principles. Uh, principles of ICOMOS are not binding, they are not legal or anything, but they have been used you know, in many uh, organizations across the world to adapt some of their guidelines and, and, and standards of conservation. So why not also give it a try in documentation. Oh, sorry. So um, this quote from Smith that I found in one of the muse in the museum magazine in 1990, I, I like a lot because it talks about compromising the values of the heritage we serve if we don't we are not careful the way that we utilize technology for our work. And I think that with this I would like to thank you and leave you here. So so I I, I think I met my time, right? Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much. <laughs>
you, Mario. I'm, I'm going to ask you for that slide of the Tudor Sydney Opera House. <laughs> Uh, our, our next speaker is Paul Davidson, uh, who is an architect, an architect, <laughs> an architect for HABS at the National Park Service. He has 21 years of experience documenting historic structures throughout the country with HABS. His projects utilize hand measuring, 3D laser scanning, photogrammetry, total station slash GPS, and high dynamic range panoramic photography to produce archival records of historic structures. Paul holds a Bachelor of Architecture and Certificate of Preservation from Pratt Institute with extensive formal training in remote sensing and civil survey. His notable projects include the, the Ghazni Towers in Afghanistan, the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island in New York, Cape Hatteras Lighthouse uh, in North Carolina, Alcatraz Island in California, and Fort Jefferson in Florida. Uh, the, almost all of those you can see uh, the pieces of downstairs in our, uh, in, uh, our exhibition. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming Paul Davidson. Exciting title. It's about to get more exciting. <laughs> now you've all paid for a full seat here. You're probably only going to need the edge. <laughs> Let's get into it. Old timey stuff. New timey stuff. Laser scanners are awesome and not. Photogrammetry, same thing. At any time, any time you could start that. We're going to compare them. Collecting accurate data is hard. Making stuff is harder. Your data doesn't care. Why do you? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if this is in here. Actually, I made it a few months ago and then did the presentation. I didn't really follow this. But the last thing, time permitting. <laughs> And that's all I got, thank you. <laughs> you know, I've been using these images for quite some time in presentations, and it's funny because we've been staging photos of us measuring since the beginning. And it's clear that this 34 photo is definitely staged, because this is not a real dimension. What, one from, you're measuring from one flute of a column to another flute? <laughs> But it's all right. I mean, we do it. 2010, that's me. <laughs> but we take real dimensions, too. And I'm going to present about a lot of technology. But uh, we generally are spending more time hand measuring on a site than we are capturing digital data. And we're no strangers to field testing new recording technologies. So we had film photogrammetry, transits, plane tables. And we're early adopters of computer aided drafting, but we still accept hand measured drawings. And a lot of this technology is really what leads to what we're using today. A lot of the rules that, that were applicable to this are, are still applicable today. So the new timey stuff. We got accurate GPS. We got a robotic total station. It talks. We got a mid-range laser scanner and a long-range laser scanner. And if you stand in the wrong place, all the photos taken, I'm going to do that to you. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a name. That's Dana Lockett. All right, we got Wally. Wally will do fine resolution, small objects up to about a car size. And then digital photogrammetry, that's going to do I mean, you can scale that up from very small objects to multi-acre sites. All right, we're going to get you to be professionals in this, OK? So some of you know this stuff, but some of you may not. So we got a group of objects. We put our laser scanner down. We shoot our lasers. It's only going to see those surfaces that it can see in that view. Everything else is in shadow, so you're not seeing, you're not capturing those surfaces. All right, what do we do? If we're rich, we're going to buy a bunch of scanners. If 
we're not, we're gonna move that scanner around and try and fill in that data. Now, as soon as we move the scanner, we're not, a, we're not talking about the accuracy of the spec sheet anymore. Now we're relying on the surveyor's experience and whatever method that they use. So oftentimes the model be quoted from a single position, but some models are hundreds of stations. So this issue of scan shadow is worse in elevation in that you can't really get scanner at height. In some places we can get on the roof and fill in that information, but this isn't always possible. So 100% is really difficult. Now we have a bunch of stations and we have to put them together into a model. There's three ways that we can do that. We have a target base. This is putting out a bunch of targets and making sure stations see targets in common. We have cloud to cloud. This is using, this is no targets. We're just using the object or surrounding objects and the overlap to best fit the stations together. And we have a sensor-based onboard sensors or tracking motion, sometimes in real time while it's scanning, so a mobile mapping solution. But in the end, uh, I've arranged them in terms of most accurate to least, just in general. So some of the limitations we have uh, is registration error. So it's very accurate, but if we put it together wrong, this is a thin slice through a parapet wall. Oh, I jumped ahead. So those two lines, they should be laying on top of each other directly. So there's about a foot and a half gap there. That's not so great. And then we have these minor errors that we get. Now, if the data doesn't line up, it's hard to pick out the details. And then if we're trying to draw plans or model geometry off of this, we're guessing at where that line work should go. So ideally, we don't have this. We have a range and resolution issue with scanning. The further away you get from the laser scanner, the less accurate the data. Also, the less resolution you can achieve. And then dark surfaces, they're gonna absorb a lot of the light energy and not return points. And the points it does return are gonna be less accurate than on a light surface. They might not even be usable. And then lastly, glass and high gloss finishes. I mean, I think that image is, speaks for itself, but you definitely got some good data on those tires. <laughs> it's like that invisible car, invisible plane. One of the big things that people don't understand about the laser scan data is really it's big picture data. Um, it'll define like the door and window locations or floor and ceiling and where the roof is really well, but it's not gonna pick out those details or define them very well. So if we blow that up, what do you think compared to the hand measured field note? That's good. It'd be hard to extract that. And we do have some technology, we could get a better resolution model but really, the time it would take to collect and process and turn that into a line drawing, it's just best to do it on site with the detail in front of you and be, in, be interpreting it in the field. All right, you're all experts on laser scanning. <laughs> and you will get a certificate. All right, we have uh, close range photogrammetry. This is taking photos to make 3D models. This is our typical kit. And if you're gonna set up the equipment, you might as well do a photogrammetric project of it, right? So I got some of the images down there that went into the model. Then you have two views on the right there, and the rectangles represent where the camera was when the picture was taken, and that's part of what the software has to solve for. So you're gonna see a couple more images like that. So a camera's not a survey sensor, it doesn't have a spec, so we wanna create it, we have to lock it down and make it a survey instrument. We gotta start by uh, selecting the right sensor. So a DSLR is good. Maybe not a GoPro so much or your phone, but you can, they're just limitations and you have to work around them. Here's some other things some of you will know and some I'm not gonna go through them all, but essentially everything in a modern camera that makes it easy to take a good photo you're not allowed to use. <laughs> and then once you have the sensor and the settings, 
There are two types of capture. You're gonna line up parallel to the surface, get 66% overlap. Yes, I mean, it's not precise. You kind of eyeball it, but get the pacing right. Convergent, point the camera at the center, 10 to 15 degrees. Now we can uh, combine these two methods together to create a single model. So if we were trying to work around the corner of a coplanar, we could switch to convergent to get to the next surface, if that makes sense. Anyhow, you can mix them together. Some of the limitation of photogrammetry are the same as uh, laser scanning. You have glass, high gloss surfaces, chrome, they're not gonna map well. But also smooth surfaces. So this isn't a problem with laser scanning. A smooth surface meaning any of, well, most of these surfaces in here wouldn't map well because there's no texture on it or difference that it can pick up. Another difference is it doesn't have level inherently. Your, your model will probably be sideways or upside down. And then there's no scale, so you have to add it. And the most difficult part is the light part. So interiors are tough and fighting the sun all day is tough. The big advantage is I can take the camera off the ground, reduce stability, and still get the same accuracy as I do on the ground, which is very different from laser scanning. So I can get a mast, a lift, a drone, as long as my shutter speed's fast enough, I'm as fast on the ground, as I'm as accurate on the ground as I am in the air. This sad guy, he's gotta stay down there. Once he's airborne, we lose accuracy, at least at this point. And some comparisons, I'll harp on accuracy, it's my thing. Uh, this is just showing we can, we can achieve the same accuracy with both systems if we're doing everything correctly. And then our control points are telling us we could actually exceed the accuracy of laser scanning uh, with photogrammetry. You'll have to trust me on that. All right, I call this Wizard of Oz. This is more looks can be deceiving. So with photogrammetry, you can take a poor resolution model and drape a high resolution texture over top of it and it will make it look beautiful and all the details there. However, we can't use that photo texture to extract information, dimensional information. So we couldn't replicate a component in this model and we probably couldn't extract information. But you, if you're not exploring it, might not know that about this model. It's a great interpretive model. It's lightweight, it's easily shared, but in terms of rehabilitation, not so great. Now, point clouds have a different problem is you almost always see them with the camera pulled really far away, so they look solid. But when you bring a, you get in close to try and extract a detail, essentially, the detail starts to break apart because there's space between the points. So buyer beware is what I'm saying. All right, now that you're experts on photogrammetry, I'm just gonna run through the reptile discovery project and let you know how we use all this stuff. So we want a good specification first and foremost. We wanna tell the sponsor exactly what we're scanning and why we might not be able to map every surface if there's access issues or vegetation or something that's blocking what we need to map. We want to tell them what equipment we're using. We want to tell them what resolution we're going to give them. For laser scanning, we're going to base that resolution on the max we can get out of the machine, three to five millimeters. For uh, photogrammetry, we're going to look at the smallest detail and then set our resolution based on the size of that detail. We want to set a number for accuracy. And then we also, that number is important, um, but really it's the assessing and controlling of that number. I mean, that number can be deceiving. So part of that assessment is literally slicing the cloud to make sure that at least overlapping scans are lying directly on top of each other. And we'll do that thousands of times. We'll do that initially when we post-process just to check. And then we're always cutting it up to create the drawings. So we're doing that while we're creating the drawings too. 
and the digital deliverables. Uh, a lot of formats you might be familiar with, some you might not. Just we want some open source formats. Um, we'll probably deliver some proprietary ones as well. But these are the ones that are acceptable at the National Archives. One day. All right, by now you guys should know a Habs measure drawing is not using one technology, right? Everyone's shaking their head no. <laughs> I'm failing. All right. That's going to happen. Lots of measuring by hand. Believe me, we're not lying. Some historic drawings, images, and research are informing our drawings. We got photogrammetry dealing with all the highly ornate stuff. Some GPS. Let's get this thing locked down on the ground on the earth. We're going to use uh, old meat mort. He's going to help control accuracy, too. And we got our laser scan data. Some of the challenges. <laughs> An operating zoo, venomous and poisonous animals, and fending off <laughs> the reptile attacks. Daniel D'Souza never made it out of there. <laughs> Some real things, we got vegetation against the building, right? So that's gonna to be tough mapping those surfaces. And we might just have to use a tape measure. <laughs> and then we have it on the inside of the building too. Plus a lot of mechanical systems keeping those ecosystems going. So tight spaces, this not ideal. So who's the star of the show? Not many people would say that, not these days. But I'll tell you why. This, is that enough for you guys to understand why? Oh, that's the staircase. That's the only staircase that ties the basement for a second and third floor together. Now, if I just use a cloud solution, and probably if I just use a target solution in that staircase, I might have very accurate floor planes, but the relationship between like the basement and the first or the basement and the second would be, could be off by a lot because I only have one hinge point for all that data. So what do we do? We're gonna put a network of targets up from the ground into those upper stories. This is something that's hard to accomplish with cloud to cloud. Now we can survey this just with a laser scanner, like make sure that we capture a target in the third floor window from the ground, and then when we're in the third floor interior, we capture that same target. Mm. Or we can use this guy, He'll blast out his laser beams, which look squiggly because the screen is squiggly. That's interesting. They're straight, I promise. <laughs> um, and that just gives us a really accurate point that we can uh, kind of use, we can use that to keep the laser scan data, we can judge its accuracy by having a higher order accuracy network, if that makes sense. Probably not. Meet more. All right, photogrammetry. This is for all the ornate stuff. We got our scale bars. We got targets. We got meat mort. Bam. All right, so he's going to provide level. He's going to be a check on our accuracy. He's going to do something else. Uh, he's going to put these models in the same coordinate space as the laser scan data. Right, so one model with all this data in it. Hooray. All right, and then resolution. So terrestrial scanning, we are limited by the physical size of the laser as it leaves the scanner. So there's a set resolution we can get, and the further away we get from the object, that beam gets bigger. Now we can set the scanner, we could, we could tell the scanner, go ahead and get a millimeter resolution, and it'll oversample that surface, and in the end, it'll probably kind of make those details harder to pick out. So we don't want to scan past the resolution of that diameter. Photogrammetry has, in theory, an infinite resolution. So it's sensor, sensor megapixels, uh, lens, and how close I am to the object. So 0.19, so that's submillimeter, and we're only processing half the resolution of the photos. So I don't know if we can get to the atomic level or what, but. 
Last, well, last thing for this slide, this is a purple dinosaur. This is also a purple dinosaur. And that, you yeah, know, okay. What is the relevance of this? I don't know, I'm not answering that. All right, moving on, final drawings. So it's not just like, okay, we're gonna take our complete model, we throw it in CAD and we're gonna trace it. Uh, it, it helps to have someone there who's familiar with the site. And we're not just scanning architectural features, we're scanning the surface of everything that's in there, the animals, the vegetation. It's hard to pick out that stuff. So while we might have a 2D uh, representation of the point cloud up, we also have to have a 3D version that we're, uh, we also have to have a 3D version that we're navigating as well, and also hundreds of reference images. So just having the laser can't scan data set, you're probably not gonna get a set of measured drawings out of it easily. So we, once we figure out all that big picture laser scan data stuff, we can layer in our hand measured drawings at a one to one scale. And then that photogrammetry usually comes in as the ortho images. All right, field notes. So usually with digital data, there are no field notes, um, but they are a uh, Secretary of the Interior Standards for our measured drawings. And we definitely, even if you weren't creating, you know, HABS documents, we would want to have some information about the digital file that you have there. Um, just having a file really doesn't tell us much about the quality of the data. So for us, what we specify is metadata forms, and these just speak about when the, when the survey was done, who did it, and what equipment was used, and then a breakdown of every station and the settings for those stations. And then we also want a registration or an accuracy report, and those are generated automatically out of the software. We want ortho renders, so if we don't have file or we can't open the file, this will give us some good, a good idea of what kind of data was captured. Was there enough resolution or coverage for us to create the drawings that have been submitted? And then, of course, we're going to want to see some hand-measured details because um, we know that it's really not possible to create a full set of drawings without doing some hand-measuring at least for the HABS collection. All right, so I made this definition up, uh, but it's the scanning and storing of data without producing something from it. And this is it, this is, if you make it through this, we're done, okay? <laughs> but it's a half hour slide. <laughs> All right, so by now, the data doesn't necessarily contain all the information for the site. So you can't rest on your laurels and let the site melt into the ground. This is a big one. I just get files all the time. I have no idea what they were scanned with, what accuracy they are. Are they suitable for measured drawings? Are they suitable for reproduction uh, or an engineering project? Or maybe it's just an interpretive model and it doesn't have a lot of resolution or accuracy. So we need to have some information about the file. This is also true, they're huge files. Windows and Mac operating systems aren't going to recognize these files. Um, they're not easy to share, and though there are some free viewers for them, really if you want to extract information from these files, you're going to need expensive software and someone who's trained to get that information for you. High quality accurate data is expensive. So if you've got a hole in your roof, fix that before you scan and can. <laughs> no, there's a lot of needs for a historic site. So this one is like, oh, I spend so much effort on this. Open source format's not a guarantee we're gonna open this data. This is last week. This is 70 stations sitting on top of each other in one model. 
So it was a nice farmhouse. <laughs> and this is open source format. And this is something we do in the office is we export and then we immediately import to test the data, which is not always the case for all the information out there. And you're writing billions of coordinates to a file that may get up to a terabyte in size. Could there be a possibility that something's miswritten? Absolutely. This is true. I mean, cost is coming down, but they're also, you don't want this on a thumb drive in your desk. So if you're going to get this information, if this is going to be something that you do at your historic site, you have to have some plan for where that file is going to go. Who's going to remember that that survey happened in 10 or 15 years and be able to go retrieve that file? And also, let's hope it has that survey spec with it. And then last but not least, canned data is never as tasty as fresh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and that's all I got. Break Q&A at 3.15. Thank you, May. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have a break now. Come back here for the Q&A at 3.15. Thank you. <laughs>